Awesome. How's it going, everybody? Good. Doing well? Good summer? Yes. All right. I've had uh, enough cold brew for this whole room, so I think we're going to be okay up here. Um, I'd like to just get kick things kicked off a little bit with uh, a few slides before we bring up uh, Bob Fabio, the, the keynote of this uh, founder story up here. Um, kind of kick things off. Some of you may have heard, some of uh, this might be uh, fresh in your mind from other events that we've done here at Capital Factory, but for those of you that might be new in the room, maybe it's your first day in Austin, first week in Austin, first month, um, or if you've been here for three years like me or, or longer, um, the Texas Manifesto here at Capital Factory was really the brainchild of Josh Baer, founder CEO here at Capital Factory. Um, just kind of highlighting the competitive advantage there is here in Texas um, for startup companies. It's one of the 10th largest economies in the world standing by itself. Um, and each city is a major market here in the U.S. Um, four of the 11 largest cities in the, in the U.S. are here uh, within Texas, all in driving distance of each other. Uh, that's Austin, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, as you can see on the screen. Um, and Dallas is, you know, the place where we've expanded to. We have a location up there in Dallas. 50 of the Fortune 500 companies are located up in Dallas. We want to partner with all of them being Capital Factory. Um, lots of oil money, family money, family offices, um, investing into real estate and oil, like I just mentioned, but also um, the opportunity of investing in startups. And we want to help educate them on this side of things and, and introduce them into startups as well. Houston, having the competitive advantage of one of the largest medical centers in the world. Uh, and then also on the same vein as is, is Dallas, lots of money that we want to educate on investing into, into startups. Uh, and then San Antonio, not to be forgotten either, budding ecosystem. I meet with some really cool companies out of San Antonio um, that are really taking on big things. Lots of cybersecurity in the area as well. Um, and then of course, Austin, why we're all here. Startups has really kind of become what this place is all about. Um, always on one of the top charts of best places to start a business, best place to live. Um, I'm sure a lot of us in this room are um, feeling that today. Um, so just a little bit about our manifesto here. Um, you can read more uh, the, at the blog post there. Texas Startup Manifesto will we'll take you to, dot uh, com will take you to Josh's blog post on it. Um, another note, the Center for Defense Innovation here in the U.S., quite frankly, there's three innovation units that are all housed under Capital Factory um, in this space. Nowhere else in the world are those uh, three agencies all under one roof. That's DIU, AppWorks, and Army Applications Lab under Army Futures Command. Um, and thanks to Josh, thanks to the government, thanks to some of our directors helping bring them here to Capital Factory. Um, it's just another competitive advantage we can bring to our member companies and our portfolio companies. Um, so if you're looking to provide or provide your product that's already in the commercial market to these uh, to the defense side of things, we want to make sure that you have that uh, accessibility. Um, they're looking for dual use solutions, things that are already in the market uh, that they can um, leverage for for uh, the government. Um, and then. We're all here today for Founder Stories, but there's other things that happen on Tuesday, which uh, this is kind of our day when we like to have reoccurring bank themes. Um, every Tuesday, every month, we have something going on. Uh, Intro to Fundraising in Texas AMA um, is on the first Tuesday of the month. Usually ends with a happy hour. We bring in a VC uh, here in Texas to that, put them on a panel like today, and kind of run through what it's like fundraising in Texas and get the VC's perspective. Um, on the second Tuesday of the month, we have Intro to Austin Startup Scene. Super helpful if you're new to Texas, new to Austin, um, so that you can understand all the co-working spaces, all the incubators, accelerators, uh, venture firms in town, where you can go for help. Uh, intro to Defense on the third Tuesday, and concurrently um, a road trip on the third Tuesday, uh, where we go to one of the other cities, um, kind of fulfilling that Texas manifesto here in uh, Austin, where we drive up, we uh, put all the startups, mentors, and VCs on a bus where uh, we just kind of have a great day. We go have epic office hours, which is like speed dating with mentors and VCs. Um, and then also ends with a fundraising in Texas um, where we do that in one of the other cities, um, put on that event. And then the fourth Tuesday, while we're all here, personally my favorite, I get to be really selfish with it. I get to ask the questions I want to ask, learn from their, learn about their, the, the founder's journey and, and what made them successful, how they learned from the failures, the successes, um, and what keeps them going today. So. Um, with that said, I'd like to do a quick intro before we dive into the main event. Um, he's been a serial entrepreneur and a VC. 
here uh, in Austin. Um, he's brought upwards of 1.5 billion, that's with a B, to, in shareholder value. He's an e &Y Entrepreneur of the Year, um, and as a testament to the true success you can have here in Austin, in Texas, um, with that said, I'd like to bring up Bob Fabio. Thank you. So, I'll probably just start with the layup, um, one that I'm sure you've heard before. Um, when did you know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Was it you selling gum sticks out of your locker in elementary school, or what did that look like for you? I think that uh, for me, it was, well, let me check. I think for most people, um, it's in their blood or it's not. It's part of their DNA. There are some people that go off and start businesses on necessity or because they you know, meet somebody and they get lured in, and there are others, crazy people like me, that thinking about doing his ninth startup um, it's just part of my DNA and uh, so I, there's a story my mother tells when I was uh, about four years old she gets a call um, and uh, it's a neighbor asking do you know where your son is uh, no I think he's in the backyard playing no he's not what do you mean no he's not um, no he's standing at my front door trying to sell his toy truck and car tires for a penny a piece around here. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it started really young. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so similar to that, selling gum sticks on a locker type of deal. Um, I always hear that, and I, I think that's super interesting. Um, also, I appreciate you sharing that. So, was, you know, you've had some successes in your career, but was your first, what was your first startup, and was it the one that I'm familiar with, or is it something that we might not have heard about? You haven't heard about it. All right. You mind telling us about it? So I was, uh, you know, I'm an old fart. <laughs> so I was uh, 22, and I was um, in Rochester, New York, a couple of years out of college. And I had this wacky idea that um, uh, this was back when mainframe computing existed, and Windows, yeah. windowing stuff didn't even really exist. The Mac was just, there was uh, prototypes from Xerox of Macintosh interface. And uh, I had this wacky idea that what if you could, um, what if you could be in this work environment where you said, what are all the documents I've created with the words Nixon adjacent to Watergate that dates me? Um, and it popped up with the respective apps, all the content you've created. It's essentially Windows um, or Mac. And so I, I launched a business as a young guy actually raised some seed capital and not enough and so I gave it back and I went off to my first institutional back startup in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. yep. Was that before joining some of the corporates that are on your LinkedIn and your resume? Um, well, I, I was at Kodak. Mm -hmm. and when you started that company? Uh, when I was doing that, yeah. So that was my first job out of college. Some Kodak company. Awesome. <coughs> so I hear a lot of entrepreneurs talk about how they didn't know about VC fundraising back in like the 90s and, and the 80s and how did you stumble upon that especially at 22 and when some people like go to fund, start their business and they don't even think that's an option well I wasn't I was trying to raise money from high net worth individuals mm -hmm. so I had a boss at Kodak that was plugged into that world and wow. he got me in front of a bunch of folks with money at a country club and I did a presentation not knowing really what I was doing um, and um, experience so yeah <laughs> I did raise money but not enough and um, the rest is history so went off and did all that. sure but it was a great learning experience I was working a full-time job finishing up a master's degree and starting a business which is sort of how I live my life there you go There's always always a lot going on yeah seriously <coughs> um, that's that's quite a bit to manage um, so I and then I noticed on on your LinkedIn you went from IBM to, to starting Tivoli. Did you start Tivoli while you Tivoli Systems while you were at IBM? Did you quit your job at IBM to, to get that started? Um, kind of kind of walk us through that process. Actually, the the truth is that most people don't know this. Um, uh, the idea from Tivoli I had prior to coming to Austin. Mm -hmm. So I was at I had left the startup. I was at Prime Computers. Um, as a chief architect uh, for a distributed computing project and partway into that they canceled it and so I've 
thought, oh, Lord, I just started here. It's only like five, six months into the stint. Now what am I going to do? And they said, well, we've got another project for you. It's uh, a bit ill-defined. Um, we've got Primos computers. We've got these new things called, you know, PCs. Uh, there's many computers. Someone needs to figure out how to manage this mess. And so I went, really? That's what you want me to work on? Okay. So I started to think about it. And uh, uh, I remember walking into my boss's office one day, and I said, I think I've got it. And he said, what? I think I know how to do it. He said, well, how are you going to do it? I said, I'm going to manage it as if it's a single computer. And he said, what? He said, where did that idea come from? I said, I don't know. Um, and so they started to fund that, and then they canceled that, and that's when I decided I was going to leave there. And the next thing I know, I'm here in, in Austin. So I'm working at IBM, and I'm working in the field of uh, uh, clustering and distributed computing. And as soon as I get here, they've changed me now, and they want me to work on systems management stuff. I'm like, not again. <laughs> and so I started to do that, um, but it was for one computer. It was for a brand new computer that um, we were focusing on. In the end, I was one of uh, eight chief architects at IBM, the most inventive, and I had about 300 programmers ultimately building software that I was responsible for ensuring was architecturally correct. And I thought, you know, I get we got to manage this new computer we're bringing to market, but this is not the world. The world is becoming a networked place. And so I thought, I need to go do this. Mm -hmm. And so about two and a half years into my stint at IBM, I left IBM without a job. Mm -hmm. I had almost no money to my name. So it was pretty yeah. crazy. And launched Tivoli. Wow. Yeah. And then, so Tivoli idea was before you got to Austin. Um, what was kind of going, what was what was the ideation stage? Like when you had no money, like what, what did you scrap together to to make that happen, to get really to really get started. So just to paint a different a picture. So this was in 1989. Okay, so I had this wacky idea that I'm going to manage a network of computers that are far flung, with a, like a single computer and do it with a graphical user interface. That was the basic idea. No one on the planet had done this, and I knew what IBM was doing. I knew what Sun was doing at the time, HP, etc. Because I was an industry leader. And they were all talking about it, but no one was doing it. So when I thought, I'm going to go off and do this, the first thing I faced, like you all probably have heard from others, is you can't do it. And how in the world are you, you can't do it? You're going to compete with IBM and Sun and HP to do this? I said, yeah. Why not? Well, because it's not going to work. And I said, yes, it will. They're very parochial. They're thinking about only their world, their world of network computers or their single computer. I'm Switzerland. And so that was really the germ of it. But um, back then there was no help. And I tell people that when I was starting Tivoli in um, 1989, uh, Tivoli ultimately was the first enterprise software company ever funded by Austin Ventures. There, were no, there, were no, it was, there was no startup scene. Um, there were no mentors to help <laughs> folks like us. Um, there weren't even lawyers or accountants or or anybody that understood how to how to get a deal done and get it right, and, you know, it was just I I I I I I've told people it was like every day I got up and I was in a dark room smashing around, and it was pure instinct. I had nobody to ask, and you know you make plenty of mistakes smashing around, but you know I apparently got a few things right. So it was really really hard. Yeah. And then was that started with a team that you had that was, uh, you, you kind of found somebody equally as crazy or was it solo founder type of deal? Um, so there were, uh, at one point, uh, six of us in my living room, uh, you know, as I started to birth this idea in this company and there were six people, um, a couple, one from Tandem, a couple from IBM, um, three or four, three from IBM and another one from somewhere else. And when push came to shove and it was time for us all to leave on that Monday, I'm the only one that did. Um, <laughs> and a couple, a couple three ba bailed out. They said, you know, too scary, can't do it. Yeah. And a couple said, well, when you secure some kind of money, uh, call us and we'll come and do this with you. Mm -hmm. So. Um, if you risk it for us. <laughs> Well, it wasn't much of you. I mean, what I found myself doing quickly is scrambling to figure out what in the world, how am I going to, I got to get some money coming in. Yeah. 
Um, and I was fortunate that I had people calling me saying, can you help with this and can you help with that in the area of systems management at the time. So, and so I lined up a bunch of, I lined up a fair number of uh, contract jobs mm -hmm. and uh, used the excess cash from the contracting to build a prototype of this idea. Mm -hmm. It's a hard way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was working 80 hours a week servicing the contracts and then trying to drive the, the, the direction of, a, of this new business. And, you know, I was 31 years old and I had been in a startup in Massachusetts. Um, I was in a very hot startup in Massachusetts. So when I came to Austin, I knew what startup life, life was like. I knew what you had to do, you know, you, know, you poured stuff in it. Nobody here in Austin that I met at the time knew anything about a startup. <laughs> so they thought I was out of my mind. Out of my mind. You want us to work what? How hard? When? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, this is what you do. We've got balance here, man. <laughs> in the, on the East Coast and the West Coast at the time, there were these subcultures of people that all they did was get up and work in startups, kind of like there is now here, but not back in 1989. So I was um, viewed as a bit of an outcast around <laughs> town, and um, there's some other reasons for that I'll, I'll talk about later. But anyway, um, yeah, we got a prototype done, and then I called the CEO of the company I worked for in Massachusetts, the startup. Okay. And he was very plugged into the VC world, and I asked him if he would give me an hour if I flew up there to share an idea with him. Yeah. And I did. Um, and he was gracious to give me two hours. Um, and he didn't know this field, but just like I now, I'll look at deals all the time, and I don't know the field that you're talking to me about necessarily. I'm not deep, I'm not a domain expert. I have a nose for a deal. I can tell when there's a pony there or not, often. And so um, he looks, I said, well, what do you think? He said, interesting. And he said, uh, he said, but don't call me again. I said, what? He said, don't call me again until you've had the guts to go do it. I said, well, wow. Yeah. It was really effective. So uh, he said, um, and when you have had the guts to go do it, call me and I'll help you get in front of VCs. And so about almost a year later, we had a prototype and I called him and he got me in front of some of the top VCs in the country and the rest is history. Awesome. Yeah. So had AB, AB came in at that point, Austin Ventures, or did they come yes, in at a later point? No, they came in, but they didn't. Um, this deal and me, were like square pegs and round holes mm -hmm. at the time. AB had never done a deal like this. Um, I remember, so what happened was I had gone and seen a bunch of folks on the East Coast um, that uh, Jit Saxena, the CEO, knew, and they started to get interested, but no one pulled the trigger. Um, and then I talked to AB till the cows come home and uh, they didn't pull the trigger. And I'm thinking, okay, this is getting to be weird. And then all of a sudden, somehow I got in front of Kleiner Perkins. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, John Dorr flies in, um, and he had been in the newspaper all over the front page of the Wall Street Journal about some deal that had crashed and burned, and you know he lost a gazillion dollars. And I thought, oh my God, this guy's gonna be in a horrible mood coming to see me today. Mm -hmm. And to make a long story short, I pitched what we were doing, and it was a horrible presentation in retrospect now. <laughs> and he gets up from the table and he goes, "I love it. You're gonna have a term sheet tomorrow." Wow. I went, "What?" <laughs> And so then, all of a sudden, AV gets wind of it, and then they want in, and then Matrix Partners in Boston yeah. wants in, and so um, that's how it all came together. Wow, that's awesome. Um, I bet that it sounds like a lot of the fundraising that I hear about today when I when I meet with founders. Um, you know, it's it's that process of locking down that lead and mm -hmm. um, seeing a lot of people then follow um, after they said, "Come back to us when." Yeah. So. Similarities to from then into now still, um, which is super interesting to see. So, with that funding, what were you able to accomplish? If if you can recall, to, it doesn't need to be outrageously specific, but what what did that funding allow you to do? Well, we raised three and a half million dollars in a Series A. Um, got you know, in hindsight, got taken to the cleaners, like most of us do when we don't know what we're doing. Sure. Um, uh, you know, um, and um, it allowed us to build the initial team. Build, um, you know, the first version of the technology, 
um, and start to forge ahead on the marketing and sales front early on. Um, I ended up leaving Tivoli um, about almost three years into it. I went through a messy personal situation and, and it was, I needed to go do, deal with that. Um, so that was unfortunate, mm -hmm. but um, uh, you know, it, it took us a long ways down the road. Got it, awesome. Um, and then there was, were you a part, then a part of the exit process with Tivoli or was that? I, I was, uh, well, well, I was, uh, I wasn't there in the business at the time, but I was very plugged into what was going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Got it. Very good. I was already off doing another one. Yeah. And that's Dave, Dazzle. Dave Dazzle? Yeah. Dazzle Corporation? Yeah. So the, 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 the sequence went, I was, in, I was employee number 14 of a startup in Massachusetts that ultimately went public. Um, and then uh, a year after that, Tivoli went public. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and then of course the year after that got bought. And then I was in the middle of running another company I started called Dazzle. How did that and, come about? Um, well, they all, so I, I'm, I'm gonna say something and I, this may be nutty, but I'll say sure, it. Sure, go for it, that's why we're here. Um, my whole life and in my career in particular, I've never really fit in. And I've always wondered why is that, and why do people pester me? You got to be more like this and more like that. And I keep, you know, I've taken feedback and tried to shape a lot of. But I've always thought differently. I see things people don't see. I think differently about things. Um, and often people will say, "Well, how can you help me in a startup, or how can you be of help to me?" And I go, "If you only knew what goes on in this brain." <laughs> well, um, this weekend, I had my brain crazy stuff. This past weekend? Yeah, it was really cool. But in the process of doing that, I was diagnosed with high functioning Asperger's. Interesting. So that's why I don't fit in. I think differently. Yeah. So I can't tell you the number of times people will look at me and go, how in the world did you come up with that? And I go, I don't know. <laughs> it is. It's up there. See? I've connected dots. You, Most people don't. So with Tivoli, it was, uh, what my brain does is it looks at chaos differently, I think, than people, and I, and I turn chaos into something simple, okay? Mm -hmm. So with Tivoli, it was this mess. I mean, there's all these computers and all this crap hanging up, all these computers and the network and this and that. It's like the spaghetti thing, and how are you gonna, well, okay, well, we're just gonna put it into a single computer thing, but it's virtual and it's graphical. So Dazzle, um, at the time, um, there was, there were all kinds of um, enterprise applications emerging in the marketplace in corporate America, like SAP and Bond and mm -hmm. PeopleSoft, and there was all these desktop app, apps, and 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 the world was attempting to distribute information electronically, um, but there was no reliable delivery mechanism. I mean, there was email. Um, uh, and, and so I thought, well, gosh, in, in, in the computer infrastructure today, um, you know, there's database management and um, uh, there's systems management and all this stuff, but how about output management? Who's, who's taking care of reliably, like electronic FedEx, where when you send something to people, you may want to receive things via fax and you email and uh, you on the web. And, and so how do we reliably get information distributed around the world not based on a destination, but based on how you want to receive it. And so, in invented this output management system that created a whole new industry. Um, and ultimately, Dazzle was, uh, at the time when I was running it, um, picked as one of the fastest growing enterprise software companies in the country. Um, and I was fortunate that Goldman Sachs was about to take us public, so that liquidity event number four. Mm -hmm. And uh, right before we were about, to, literally two weeks before we were going public, um, HP and Xerox got in a bidding war over us, and ultimately HP paid us more for the company than we could have gone public for. Mm -hmm. So we sold it, and uh, so that was another nice liquidity event. Yeah, especially when you can get two companies like that to, to fight over you a little bit. Yeah, and I mean back, you know, Tivoli Dazzle days. This is this is the '90s, so you know most of you what you're doing in the 90s, but um, this is not the days when you, you know, there were unicorns or you could put something on a napkin and make a billion dollars. It was, it was a very, I mean, if you could, if you could exit a business and get a couple hundred million dollars for a business, you were like crazy. It 
was like crazy stuff. And so between Tivoli and Dazzle, that was a billion dollars. So on the, actually, for a second, reprogrammed your brain. I don't know if this is, is this an area you're coming <laughs> willing to travel down with me, or should we? Fascinating shit. Yeah? <laughs> So this is a revelation uh, with the high functioning Asperger's as well. This is this is something you've just found out in the past yeah, I mean, four I, days. I, I, I mean, I'm I, you know I, I I have these certain quirks about me, and I'm not like you know, and 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 I've through the years been coached on all this stuff, and I run companies fine and all that. But if you look at the people that ultimately have changed our world, I mean, changed our world, they're high functioning. They're people on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. They think differently. They see the world differently. And we're often, we're often viewed as odd, or we don't fit in, or we got a problem. And the truth is, we have a gift. So I love that. Yeah, appreciate you sharing all that. Yeah. If and I'll say this before I forget, uh, there's a website. If you want to write this down, uh, it's my website. It's www.trafft. T-R-A-F-L-T.com and on that website is a, a set of blogs and there's about 34, 32, 34 lessons learned through all the years of me doing this stuff so maybe that you find that beneficial. Absolutely. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, so a little bit of going back, we'll, we'll kind of follow a little bit of the same journey we did with Tivoli. What was with fundraising in that capacity, you, you're familiar with it. You've done it a few times now. It sounds like, yeah. Um, especially with Tivoli, was that did that make the process easier with Dazzle? Yes and no. Um, you all know that. Fun, I mean, has anybody raised funds here, institutional money? A few. Okay. Uh, how about seed capital? Okay, it's a pain in the rear end. It doesn't matter. I mean, the world's changed. I mean. You know, it used to be that you could go and talk to someone about an idea, a venture capitalist, and if they liked your idea, and as ill-formed as it was, they'd write you a check for two, three million dollars to help you launch it. Those days are long gone. I mean, it's very rare that that happens. Now you've got to prove things and move things down a path and have some, you know, have some proof points that it's going to work. So the risk equation has changed, um, even for myself. I mean. I raised more seed capital uh, than any startup in Austin at the last company, Randy Relevance, $4.1 million for people's you know, check, personal checking accounts. It's a lot of dough. Um, and it, you know, I can't tell you the number of investors I had to talk to and the number of no's I got. So it just is hard. Uh, so yes, I mean, obviously you tracked capital if you've done things, um, but it was still hard. Mm -hmm. They put you through the ringer. Absolutely. And then from the Dazzle days that you swung into the other side of the table. I did. I uh, spent about seven years in the venture business. Um, I was one of the first three venture partners before venture partners were even, was even a concept. Um, with Austin Ventures, myself, uh, Jimmy Tribig, who's a legend, um, and Scott Harmon. And so I was an active chairman or an interim CEO in portfolio companies. So. Did that for oh I don't know just under two years and then um, got lured out of that to be a general partner in a billion dollar fund. Awesome, yeah, wow. And then that was through the dot com boom. Uh, it was the beginning of the, the dot, it was it was part of the dot com and, and part of the the boom. The, 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 <laughs> uh, so it was a little of both. Um, uh, I was fortunate. I. Um, up on the Forbes Midas list as um, I had a, for anybody who knows anything about venture capital, I had a, a, about a, I had a, I think it was an 87% IRR, wow. which was hard to do. Um, but this is, an, uh, this is a story about thinking differently, I'll tell you this. So it's the first week as a GP in a big fund, and I get a call from an inventor in Dallas, <coughs> and he wants me to come up and take a look at his invention. And I said, oh, what the heck, I don't have anything to do yet. I'm just starting to get my legs under me. So I fly up to Dallas. I meet him in the Admirals Club. I'll never forget this. I walk in, and there's this really nerdy, brainiac guy. 
And he says to me, hi, Bob, Vic Bennett, so glad you're here. I've had 22 other venture firms turn me down and I can't wait to show you what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I went, oh my word, you just said what? <laughs> so that's the way we started. So for about two and a half hours, he's scribbling all over a whiteboard and, and speaking in tongue. I mean, literally, I mean, it's like, I'm a fairly smart guy and I'm like struggling to keep up. And so then I look at my watch and I said, Vic, I gotta go, I gotta catch a flight. So let me see if I can distill this down. Remember that connecting dots thing? I said, if I've got this right, I think what you've told me is you've invented a chipset that's fully programmable that can inspect the content of packets as it flows over the network before this existed. Did I get that right? So inspection at wire speed, deep packet inspection. He said, yes. He said, how did you? And I said, I just needed to know. So I get on an airplane, I get home, I call a partner, and I said, I don't know what I just saw, but I think I just saw something that could change networking forever. He said, what do you mean? I said, this guy says he's got a patent on a chipset that does deep packet inspection at wire speed. He said, so what are you going to do? I said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to peel this technology out of his LLC that's owned by him and his wife, and I'm going to validate that that's true. And if it's true, we're going to incubate this thing, and I'm going to go build Microsoft on top of Intel. He said, what? I said, yes, he's invented the Intel for network packet switching, if that's true, and now we need to pr provide a programming environment to program to it. Um, everybody thought I was crazy. I mean, all the VCs in town, oh, he doesn't know what he's doing, he's new at VC. Well, finally, we ended up funding this deal. AV came in. Um, we put three and a half million dollars into a Series A after I incubated it. And um, that business was called Agera Systems. And it got sold to Lucent 18 months later for a half a billion dollars. Wow. 18 months? Yeah. It was truly novel. And no one had done this. And so that, when I say think differently, 22 other venture capitalists didn't see that. They didn't connect the dots. So. Should, the, should entrepreneurs in the room add that to their pitch? I've talked to X amount. <laughs> I'd suggest not leading that way. <laughs> <laughs> With all VCs, some of them maybe. <laughs> Got it. Well, that's awesome. Um, yeah, it's definitely a testament to being able to, to distill all that information down and press the stuff. Um, so life as a VC, would, would you come across other ideas like that? And you're just like, this doesn't, like, people that think this doesn't make sense, but I can just see it in. All the time. Yeah. We, um, I operated uh, my, so we ended up having about 20 people in our local office here. Um, and I operated it like a business, not like a VC firm, meaning, the first thing was, well, how do I position, how do I position this new venture firm here in Austin um, so that we'll get deal flow? It was really simple, actually, and it pissed off Joe Aragona at AB uh, terribly. But all, all we did is we said, um, we're, we're folks with an entrepreneurial background, operating success, and we have a big checkbook, too. Mm -hmm. So thought about what messaging, and we were flooded with deal flow. We were the first venture firm here locally to start doing um, uh, weekend uh, uh, startup workshops. We'd run ads in the newspaper <laughs> saying, if you got a startup idea, send it into us, we'll vet it, and by invitation only, you, you'll be brought in for a weekend. And we'd literally spend a weekend, Saturday and Sunday, with 10, 15, 20 companies and you know, what we were doing is, is we were, it was lead gen, and we were looking for a nugget because everything was so raw back then, and it still is a lot of raw ideas here in Austin. Um, and so we'd find one or two sometimes that we liked, and what we'd do is we'd shape it. 
And so we did that very early on. And then, and then AV started doing it with AV Labs and blah, 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 blah. But that was the start of it. So, yeah. and um, at, uh, this is not, now this is going to be crazy. I, I was so sought after at the time, I ended up on 17 boards, um, which was a little nutty. Um, on top of being a GP. Yeah, and running a, a team of almost 20 people. Wow. Yeah, so it was nuts. Yeah, I believe that. That's a that's a good tactic though for the lead gen. Yeah. Capital Factory doesn't use newspaper. We use websites. Well, this and was, now we're all in the room here. <laughs> this was a different time. Exactly. Hopefully, Josh doesn't get mad at me for saying that. It's okay. Um, awesome. So after after the VC life, when when did you know it was time to, to step away from that and either get back to entrepreneurship or what was that next step uh, I, and what I, was that uh, feeling like? I didn't know. I was on 17 boards and one of the portfolio companies had had raised a bunch of money. Uh, it was called VO. Um, I was on the board. Um, they were working on a, um, a technology called InfiniBand, if anybody's ever heard of that. It's a high-speed bus structure. It was very new. Chipsets were barely working, blah, 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 blah. And um, the board decided that it, it needed to bring in a new CEO. The CEO agreed. So I led the search committee to find a new CEO. I walk into a board meeting on a Thursday um, afternoon and I start to uh, tell the board um, you know we narrowed it down to two candidates and here's the one we're gonna make an offer to and here's what the offer can be what is gonna be and before I could get all that out the founder of the company stops me and says why aren't you running this company and I'm like because I love what I do and you know you can't afford it um, uh, and he said yeah but you're the best qualified by a long shot why don't you do this? And I said, no. And so I remember leaving that day and I called one of uh, the, our, the founder of the firm and I, sa and I said, uh, just got done with the board meeting. I'm gonna let you know that the board has asked me to consider running this company, um, but I'm sure nothing will come of it. He goes, all right, we'll keep you posted. And he didn't take it seriously and neither did I. Mm -hmm. We'll make a long story short, you know, sort of like how I ended up here in Austin. You know, three weeks later, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And now I'm trying to unwind myself out of six different funds or <coughs> partnerships. Um, and I'm now trying to transition out of running TL Ventures here locally while finding my way into this startup that desperately needed leadership. Mm -hmm. And so within a year, we were um, product of the year. Um, and in spite of that, and in spite of all the primary research we did, um, we were way ahead of our time and ultimately um, had to change courses and ultimately, I'll tell you what the business was. Um, I moved us away from InfiniBand-ish stuff um, as a technology provider of software. And I said, um, I think we can build an appliance here Again, thinking differently, um, that functions like autopilot for the data center. Um, and, and what we did, way ahead of its time, so this was almost 20 years ago, we built uh, machine learning technology, dynamic neural nets, that could study all layers of the computer, computer environment, down from the hardware elements all the way up to the web, and could um, uh, have this device without any human intervention adjust whatever needed to be adjusted in the enterprise to ensure that that web app continued to perform properly. Nobody believed it was possible. It, we had one of the most superb engineering teams on the planet um, and a lot of big brains in this company pulling this off. And so we got invited to demo, which if any of you have heard of this, it's, it used to be this by invitation only, uh, a small group of products and companies would get invited as leading edge, leading edge products. Um, it was the, the end of January, um, and you present to, I don't know, there's like eight, 900 people in the audience. Um, well, in, in, in November, Kids Gap runs a marketing campaign soliciting photos from parents. It's a marketing campaign. And said, turn in a photo of your children or child, and we'll pick a winner and the winner gets a full year of clothes for free from Kids Gap. 
That marketing campaign was so successful, it took down the Kids Gap website during Thanksgiving weekend. Mm -hmm. You can imagine what a disaster that is mm -hmm. for that business. So what we did is we, we decided we were going to do a demo and leave the name off, not say Kids Gap, but said an online retailer is running a marketing campaign and we had on this uh, screen, it was twice the size of that wall, um, an entire end tiered environment, all the computers, all the network segments, all the routers, all the, all the everything, graphically represented. And we started to put load on this website um, that started to crush the infrastructure and things would turn red and ultimately the, the website crashed. And so then we snapped in the VO1000 it was called um, and ran the same experiment in this single device and it would do all these counterintuitive things because it was studying dynamically all of these variables. It would start turning, we used to call, we built this Thing that had a human brain inside of it that would turn knobs and you'd see the outcome. And so it would start adjusting things in this complex compute environment that the human brain couldn't even contemplate and you'd go, what? That's not going to work. And all of a sudden it works. And so we showed that people were like going, holy moly. And uh, we had tested the daylights out of it with the market, lots and lots and lots of primary research. And in spite of that, when we brought it into the marketplace to sell it, it scared the IT people and they wouldn't buy it. Hmm. It was way out of its time. So. That's an interesting thing with timing. Yeah. We flipped it around and we said, all right, if they're not going to consume it, what we'll do is we'll use the device to provide a managed service. Managed service were just starting to merge, SaaS was just starting to merge. And what we'll do is we'll plug the device in here in Austin and connecting to their network and when this device spots problems because it could auto re remediate as well we'll we'll provide a service and we'll contact the data center people and say you're about to have a problem with your trading app and it's here's what you need to do and so we started we flipped it all around and started to sign up customers and actually signed up about 20 or 30 enterprise customers um, but then the the, the, the economic world crashed and two out of the four venture firms we had went out of business and we ended up shutting that business down. I still have that technology sitting in my house <laughs> in the closet on disk drives. Yeah, man. Yeah. That's wild. Um, so I will open up in about 15 minutes for questions. I want to get through a couple more topics um, here with Bob. Um, there was a company in the middle uh, it sounds like after that potentially White called, called White Glove Health. Um, and I'd like to kind of just touch on that briefly because um, I do want to get to Irrelevance Corp if, if you if you'll allow me. Sure. Um, and do you mind just kind of walking through how White Glove Health came about? Um, spend a couple minutes on this one because I think it also based on how both companies maybe led to Irrelevance. Yeah, you won't. Again, this is crazy thing about my brain and you won't believe this. So I'm, I'm, I'm taking some time off um, after VO and I'm actually spending 40 hours a week ballroom dancing uh, and relaxing. Um, and, um, and so I'm sitting in a Rudy's barbecue one day by myself and I'm eating and there's a line out the door and I said, this is just amazing. They provide such a great, a great, you know, great experience. Why don't I, maybe I should do a service business. You know, no more of these products. Da, da, da. And I said, no, service businesses, those are mostly lifestyle businesses. And I thought, no, what about a tech enabled service business that uh, transforms an industry or disrupts an industry, you know, changes the way people do things. But it can't be lifestyle. It's gotta be something that, you know, attacks a billion dollar market. And I'm thinking about this and, and then I finish my lunch and I go on with my day floating around out there in the universe in my brain and all this. And um, a month later, and this is how a lot of my ideas, I've got an idea right now for a startup and it's kind of the same way. Um, I get up to go to the doctors and it's downtown and I live out in Lake Lake. And so, you know, it's 8.15 in the morning or something, I got like a nine o'clock appointment and I'm traveling.
traveling downtown and I'm trying to find parking and I finally find parking and then I go into the waiting room and I'm sitting around there and then I go into the treatment room and I'm sitting around there and then they send me to the diagnostics lab and I'm sitting around there and then I get sent to the pharmacy and I'm sitting around there and then I go to the grocery store and get some stuff and then I'm coming home and it's 2.15 in the afternoon and I'm coming down my driveway and it's uh, 800 feet long and I went, holy shit. It's healthcare. The experience, it, you know, so that Rudy's thing, that conversation, it's healthcare. That experience I just had today, which is a service, you're providing a service to people when you healthcare, I can change it. And by the time I hit the bottom of my driver, I said, what if I could bring care to people, not the other way around, and do it in an affordable way? By enabling it with technology. So I call my friend, who's a very enterprising doctor, uh, has founded companies. I said, Billy, I've got an idea. He said, what's that? I said, what if we could bring care to people and do it with like a, a business model like Costco's and bring everything to the consumer? He said, what? I said, what if? Well, two days later, he's at my house. A month and a half later, we're starting this company called White Glove Health that literally transformed healthcare. In fact, Clay, has anybody heard of Clayton Christensen at Harvard? The guy who was written the Innovative, Dil innovative oh, yeah. Dilemma and all that. He got wind of this and he said it was the most disruptive idea he'd seen in a long time. What we had done is on three different axes, we had changed healthcare. The payment system was completely changed. You, you didn't file claims against your insurance. There was no claims. We wiped out the whole claim system and you paid just $35 a visit and all the care was provided to you. We changed the experience completely. You didn't go and drive around when you felt like crap and leave work or leave kids or whatever. It came to you within two hours of you contacting it and we dismantled the entire healthcare delivery system. So literally, I studied with Dr. Rice for months. Okay, what happens next? What happens next? You know, like. You know, what, what, what's the provider doing now? What, and dismantled the entire healthcare delivery system and then reassembled it with technology. So we built a technology platform that ultimately ran the entire company, including delivering healthcare. And so we literally were the first to put, using an EMR online via tablets, people, consumers could schedule care online, and we had to solve the traveling salesman problem because we had mobile, we had all these in nine markets. We had cars driving around every day with nurse practitioners, and they'd see up to 12 patients a day, and we had to optimize the routes, um, and we grew from you know, zero to, I don't know, we had like 10 million patients, um, and took the company public, and this is the lesson. Uh, in the middle, the first day of our road show in New York, um, they announced the global debt crisis. Hmm. Stock market crashes. We said, well, and so we continued with the roadshow that week. We said, well, surely, they also get, you know, Obama's going to be meet with everybody on the weekend and there's going to be something announced on Monday and the market will come back and we'll finish our roadshow and we'll get our money. Mm -hmm. Well, he announced the market crashed again the next week. We pulled our offering. Umpteen others pulled their offering. Wow. Um, we had we were supposed to get out three weeks earlier, and literally no lie. Because we we're doing a rare approach to going public, we did a Dutch auction. Lawyers argued over two sentences in our S one for almost three weeks, delayed our IPO. If it had gone out when we had planned, we would have been a public company and raised all this capital. That didn't happen. So you can build great companies, but a lot of this is luck, and. So that company never got public because I then did another IPO roadshow in the fall. We couldn't get it done because no one had tested the market yet. And I went and raised another private round uh, and then went off to have a knee replaced and uh, couldn't get out of bed for six months so I had to resign. And they went through six CEOs later and they shut it down last year. Mm -hmm. they if you don't mind, after piggybacking off of that, irrelevance. With irrelevance. So one of the things that we, um, again, 
um, I'm sitting around thinking, all right, what am I going to do next? I had come down here. I was limping around down here, mentoring pe people, and uh, and I thought, all right, well, you know, it's in my blood. I, I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do. And so I thought, well, what, what's something I learned from White Glove? And I thought, it's really odd. I watched Red Cross, Aetna, Humana try to engage people digitally. Didn't work at all. I watched employers try to do it. Didn't work at all. But we, little old White Glove Health, we had orders of magnitude better engagement rates when we tried to engage consumers digitally. And I thought, well, is it our technology that's better? And again, people said you can't send emails to patients and you can't do this because we were doing it all. We were, you know, we were on the edges of every healthcare law because um, we were going to change healthcare. And so um, I thought, I wonder what it is. And then it hit me. We were the doctor. We were the only party that had the trusted relationship with the consumer. Insurance companies didn't, pharmacies didn't, employers didn't, but we did. We were just a contemporary doctor. So I went to work to study what systems, technologies, or products were available to doctors and large hospital systems to engage patients. There weren't any. So started to build the germ of the idea is I, I thought, well, I can't bring in more software into these busy places because they, they're not going to use it. And they're not going to pay for it because if they can't file a claim against something, the payment system doesn't work. And I thought, all right, well, what if I could provide a service to them that was all technology enabled? Again, I'm using this technology enabled thing. But the initial experience is a conversation, a synthetic conversation. This is before chatbots even existed. And so, the invention was, what if we could have a doctor talk to a patient, a patient talk to a doctor, and have it become increasingly more personalized as you go back and forth, but there was no doctor. It was a computer system, and we built that before chatbots existed. Um, we tested it, started to work, but then we learned that the way to drive people to use that experience was you had to touch them in other ways, texting, email, web, blah, 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 all these channels. And then I woke up one day and I went, holy crap, what we're doing has nothing to do with healthcare, nothing to do with doctor or patient. It has to do with digital engagement. We're a marketing company. And so once we figured that out, we went out and raised a Series A, uh, went from zero to 10 million in ARR in three years. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. Had over 3,000 customers. We were selling to uh, small businesses, and in particular the healthcare industry, mostly, doctors, dermatologists, plastic surgeons, med spas, all folks that today market to their patients. And we were digitally engaging them to drive more procedures. And so we were making the doctors, helping the doctors make money. Um, and in our uh, overzealous uh, desire to keep driving top line growth, because that was driving valuation. Um, we made two interrelated distribution decisions that were disastrous. We uh, brought on um, device, and by the way, people thought this was brilliant at the time. We went and partnered with all the device companies, the laser companies, the body uh, freezing companies, etc., to take our service in with their device. They were, they were, they were uh, providing our service um, and paying for our service um, for Dr. Smith to use their device. So we were coming in with their device. And so we're picking up all these accounts. And we knew that there was some possibility that because we didn't sell to these accounts and we didn't qualify these accounts, that we could experience a lot of churn. Mm -hmm. So we worked really hard to guard against what was coming in. But we couldn't effectively control the quality of these accounts or turn them away because of our contracts with these big device companies. And so we started experiencing a bunch of churn, which if you know anything about SMB related businesses, when you start having a lot of churn, all the VCs start to go running for the hills. So I noticed this in um, December of 2017, fixed it by March of 2018. I reinvented the business, completely reinvented the business. We got rid of, you know, and it was painful. We changed out our whole distribution strategy. We changed our offering. We changed our value prop. We changed who we sold to. 
Um, and um, in the next 10 months, we grew double digits again and it ex had exceeded our revenue of the prior business. But then we got ourselves in trouble again. But it wasn't something we did. We had um, our, the bank that we had a line of credit with, we had used that line because we weren't raising a B round, so we used their capital. Um, they said, don't worry, we're not gonna call the line. This was, in, this was in October. Well, in late November, we get a call from the bank and said, um, we expect you to call to pay the, ca the line off. Well, we're, we're running out of cash. We're like, what? We were told that the bank we were working with, Square One, got bought by Pacific West Bank, and now they had a bunch of new people. Mm. They were coming in to clean their, their, their portfolio up. And so we were one of the targets, like a zillion others. So went through a brutal negotiation, kept the business going, raised some money, um, but it had so spooked our inside investors that um, in spite of us hitting our plan and growing double digits every month, <coughs> three weeks left in cash, our lead investor informed me that they weren't gonna leave the round. And so I had to walk in and tell 68 employees that tomorrow they don't have a job, but by the way, they don't have severance. Was, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. The point is, is there's things that happen, right? And you, you have to try to guard against every one of these as best you can with a plan B and a plan C. This one, <coughs> this one I, 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 I mean, I told everybody, just keep working really hard, we're gonna be fine, and I got surprised, so. And there was not enough runway to do something about it, so. Well, I appreciate you sharing all that. Yeah. Another testament to timing, in yes. favor and out of your favor. Yeah. Um, that was that was well timed. I would like to open it up now to everybody. You know, we've walked through the journey quite a bit here. Hopefully, you jotted down some questions. Um, but I'd like to open it up and, and see what everybody has and, and kind of share. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Raj, for coming in and sharing all your yeah. insight and knowledge. It's very impressive. The question I have is, what's the most painful lesson you've ever learned, and how long did it take for you to turn that into a positive? Yeah. So I've thought about this because I knew I could ask this. I ask this all the time. Um, and I decided I was going to give you two answers. Um, one on the, on the personal side, and then one on the business side. So on the personal side, there, I mean, this is the most painful and um, probably the most valuable lesson I've ever learned. Um, uh, number two isn't even a close second. And it came from my days at Tivoli. Um, if you can't learn to listen to and trust your gut, you'll never trust yourself or anyone else and your gut isn't wrong. And um, because of my brain, I can rationalize away what this is telling me. I did when I was younger. And so there were decisions early on I made about the early team where it was eating at me, wasn't working, we were having battles with each other and I knew I needed to make some changes, but I kept saying, no, it'll be fine, it'll be fine, just we gotta keep going, it'll be fine. And it was never fine. And that, decision cost me personally $50 million. Yes. So that's on the personal side, listen to your gut. If you don't, it's a problem. On the business side, um, and I just was at a startup yesterday, um, and if you go to my website, it's one of the things I wrote about. It's, um, there's, a, there's a Harvard, uh, I didn't go to Harvard, but there's a Harvard Business School question um, which is, it's very simple to say, it's really hard to, 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 to answer, which is, what business are, we, are you in? For me, uh, that, that degenerates to, or uh, it, 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 it really is a, a comprised, the answer is comprised of a series of questions. And my brain works like this. When I'm a CEO, when I'm a mentor, when I'm a venture capitalist, you can be presenting. The, the, the CEO of this company yesterday had 25 slides he wanted to present. I got through slide three. I said, I already got your business. He said, what? I don't need any more slides. Now I need to start asking questions. And so I'm like rattling now through what I call the what's. And, and most every business, young business, um, doesn't pay attention to this the way it should. And 
And if you don't gain clarity around the what's, you will flounder or fail. It's guaranteed. And even if you're an established business, if you lose sight of the what's, you'll flounder or fail. And so here's the what's. And it's really easy to say it's hard to get the answers to it. What is the target audience or audiences you're catering to? That's number one. And I'm not talking about generally. It's the CFO of every enterprise company that's in this industry. I'm just making that up. What need or problem does that audience have? And everybody stops there. They'll come back and they'll go, oh my gosh, I talked to all these people in there that are complaining about this. Failed. You failed. Because you didn't ask them another question that relates to it. That they're willing to spend money to affix or address. So it's what need or problem they have that they're willing to spend money on. What's the solution? Okay. What's the packaging and pricing of that solution? What's the competitive landscape like? What's the messages you use to reach and influence that target audience? What's the distribution channels? What's the benef benefit or value of your solution to the audience? What's the macro trends that are going to cause you to take off, et cetera. So there's all these what's. It's on my website. Um, they're hard to answer. you got to get them right. Or you see companies all the time, they, they bang around, they take forever to get some momentum, um, they go through extra rounds, lots of dilution, or they fail. And it's because no one said, we need to gain clarity about this stuff. With clarity around these things, not only does it does it catalyze the company and the people in it, because they now know why they're getting up every morning, it drives growth. Period. So that's so I was at this business and they've just raised some money and they're about to pour on the gas and they said, What do you think we should do? I said, You're not gonna like to hear this. I said, you should stop. Don't spend money right now. Don't add any more salespeople. Don't add any more marketing. Because you don't have clarity around the what's. They're like, what? I said, who are you selling to? What's your target audience? Okay? What problem or need do you think they have? I mean, you should be able to answer these things. So. I just built a deck for a company I may launch. And I've done a whole lot of primary research to answer the what's. And in a week, um, I put this deck together, and the what's are rivetingly clear as a early stage startup. And they're probably still 50% wrong, but it's a starting point. You have to do that. I have two, if that's okay. Yeah. One is, what's the story behind the name Tivoli? Yep. And two would be, back to his question, you said that you had, um, you didn't trust your gut, you lost a ton of money because of the team. Mm -hmm. So what was it, were they just the wrong people? In the so uh, the name behind Tivoli was, it was named after the gardens in Copenhagen. Um, the, I mean, the legacy, the, the, the way the story goes, that's the truth, that's how it was named. Now people say it spells I love it backwards without an E. And, and, and that's, that's, <laughs> That was, that was all after the fact. Right. Um, I'll, I'll tell you another, you know, when Tivoli had success and I was off doing other things, I used to get calls constantly from recruiters. Hey, do you know so-and-so? He says he was a founder of Tivoli. At first, it used to annoy me. It's like, really? And then I had a great answer. Gee, I don't remember that person in my living room back in the day. <laughs> Everybody wants to take credit for something. So. The um, starting a company is like starting a marriage. You have to very be very careful who you team up with. And I've learned this the hard way through lots of pain. You have to pay attention to whether you share enough of the same values and You have to do it when you pick a life partner, and you have to do it when you 
team up with people. And when you team up with the wrong people and you're counting on them, just like a life partner, every day, all the time, and they're not doing their thing, they're letting you down, then you're in a ditch. And so then all kinds of bad things happen. It becomes dysfunctional quickly. And so that's what I meant. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Um, on your cutoff, the one that, um, that was almost about to go backwards, oh, not backwards, sorry, that um, right before you guys um, go to the roadshow and the market crashed and um, it went backwards and then the next one that kind of, you know, collapsed right before momentum just because of timing and you know health and everything um what happened to your team like your co-founder like um how come like the members it seemed like you were the main um head like without you we couldn't you know proceed oh so the white glove story you mean when we went public and didn't go yeah well um I don't know if that's, I mean, you know, the, the truth is, is that when you start and run a company and you're the founder or one of the founders and I've been one, um, you have a particular presence and a particular mindset. It's like, um, all right, well, let's do it this way. Steve Jobs called me after Tivoli and personally requested that I come out and interview with him at Next, which I did. Steve Jobs has a way about him, the way he thinks, it's different. And they tried to replace Steve Jobs with other people early, you know, after he left Apple, and we know what happened. The point is, is that it's hard to replace this. And I'm not saying that in an egotistical way, it's just different. And so they brought in one person after the next, thinking that these people could both bring the energy that I brought and the this, because we were still in the formative stages. Right. And some brought a lot of energy, but not enough of mm -hmm. this, and some brought enough of this, but not enough energy, and some didn't bring either of them, right. obviously. Um, and, it's, and, and, and that's part of it, but then there's the cultural part. Um, uh, I worked with some of the top organizational psychologists in the country um, and learned an amazing amount about corporate culture. Um, and the highest performing companies, uh, there's all kinds of research, um, are the companies that have an explicit set of values and beliefs. It's a fact. Every company just um, has a culture. It may be implicit, or it may be explicitly defined, but it all has culture, just like a family. And so that's the other part. I have a set of beliefs, and the next person may not have the same set of beliefs. And so when you set up a company and you are clear about the values and beliefs of the culture, and you reinforce <clears> those, <throat> I mean, they're not supposed to be platitudes, you're supposed to be reinforcing them, and I do, then you bring someone else in and it's like, well, they don't believe in innovation, or they don't believe in people speaking up, or they don't believe in collaboration, or they don't believe in whatever, and then you have oil and vinegar and people leaving and all that stuff. So it's hard. Yes? Just kind of think back on that question. So how do you balance sort of thinking differently, just being your mantra, and also having diversity of thought and perspective? So um, part of uh, my belief system is that I, I encourage professional debate, so long as it isn't caustic or unprofessional. Uh, in fact, I welcome it. Um, I welcome it with myself and the teams because the best of ideas come from it. And so that's just a part of the fabric of the businesses I run. Um, and so because of that, you get people that will, you know, go at it. I mean, not in an ugly way. But they'll say, no, I think it's this, and no, I think it's that, da, 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 da. And, and, you know, the best ideas emerge. Do you maintain the same co-founder throughout your no. startup? No, I, um, uh, n n um, I don't believe 
I think this is a mistake people make. I, um, I, I believe you find the best talent that's available at the time you're needing to recruit, whether it's to start a business or throughout the business's life. Too often people will say, well, I know Joe, I've worked with him 16 times. I think I'll get Joe to do the lot. Sometimes that's fine, but often it's very limiting because the world changes and, and technology changes and distribution channels change and market changes. And you've got, to, you've got to fit the right person for the job now. Now there's risk with that because you may not know this person and interviewing is not a science. It's an art. And if you're lucky, you'll get, you'll get it right 50% of the time. But it really matters to put the right person on the ground now. Yes? Uh, have you ever been equal co-founder in any of your businesses? And can you talk about those experiences, positive, negatives? Yeah. So um, irrelevance, um, I had the germ of the idea, but then I brought in two uh, what we called founders. So there was three founders. Um, all, um, all as founders, not, not necessarily the same equity distribution. Yes, all as founders. Um, irrelevance, there was uh, two of us, myself and Dr. Rice, and we were equal founders. Um, and so yes, I've always, there's, um, there's been no business where I was the sole founder. Or more, I'm, I'm also, not just whether you're a co-founder, but I'm also interested in the uh, equity status. Equity, yeah. so. Like where you were co-founder of equal status with equity. Yeah, um, virtual, uh, most of them I, I was. As I've moved through That's life. primary or, or you were shared? We, we had equal. Equal, equal. But as I've moved through life, and if I'm investing more of my own personal money sure. to get started, sure, sure. Um, or it's I've had the idea, like the idea I'm working on right now, I've done I've done all the work. Yeah, I understand. Um, but I'll still bring on folks. We'll still call them founders, and we'll still arrive at a very fair um, equity arrangement um, because I want them to be motivated to, sure. you know. Um, it just depends on the circumstances. You know, sometimes you, you know, these things unfold in different ways. Um, but yeah, um, I think you have to be careful. So um, this is a funny one. You have to be careful. So I don't, I don't believe in what generally happens um, out there of doing bridge notes, convertible debt. That's what most startups do in this town and around the country. I don't believe in that. It's double taxation. Um, you're 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 paying. There's interest on the on the note, and then it converts at a discount. So it's, you're getting dinged twice. So what I do, which is quite different in any company I work with, um, we set up a cap structure that's different. Founders, founders, um, get a preferred class of stock that's priced. Their time and money is equal to anybody else's. Why should they not get preferences um, that a VC would get? If I may, most of the time, it's more common for founders to get common stock. Exactly. I don't get common stock, and the founders of my business don't get common stock. That's a that's a great way to get yourself screwed. So we do a preferred class. It may be lightly preferred, but it's a preferred class. It has its own voting rights, and it gets to weigh in every time there's a change to the corporate structure or around gets raised, etc. Um, and you get to participate in anti-dilution protection and all kinds of other things. As so, a founder? As a founder. Yeah, I've done this m multiple times and I've done it with companies I advise. Um, and the VCs are fine with it. I mean, it's got to be set up so it's professional and not weird and doesn't have kind of screwy terms, but so long as it's done right, they go, oh, you got to, you got to. So, in irrelevance, we had a preferred seed class. Um, and so, in part, there may be been differences in owner, uh, ownership, but we all had a, a common kind of class of stock that gave us a big benefit. So that's kind of how I do so it. So everyone gets preferred, then? Just the founders. The, employ, the, the employees the get the employees get options. Oh, common. and two for common stock. Yeah, oh, common nice. common stock options, which is classic. Have you read about this strategy? No. Could you? 
I'll put it, I'll create a blog. <laughs> <laughs> especially if it doesn't back you in the corner of a future round. If they're okay with it, then that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, no, that's what I do. But, but again, I was a venture capitalist for seven and a half years, and I understand how all this stuff works, and you got to be careful. So There will be investors that are not too big, like excited about that, it's maybe especially for first-time founders. I raised $4.1 million in, in a seed, seed class. That all, the, all the seed investors ended up getting a, another class of preferred. It wasn't convertible, no. So the founders had a seed class. And there was the seed investors that had seed class, and then there was the institutional preferred, and they're all preferred classes. And then the employees got common through options. Yes? You think my answer is because I'm actually negotiating right now uh, convertible note uh, with some investors, so I was interested to hear a little bit more about that. I guess one of the arguments they were making at the beginning is like, how do you value your company to be able to figure out what kind of equity you're going to give up? What are the best ones? You're in more of the starting out or in the, in the prototype stage? Well, I got news for you. You know how venture capitalists value companies at some level? It's arbitrary and capricious. Right. I mean, yes, there's benchmarks, and you know, if you're if you're at an ARR of 100 grand, or, you know, a million dollars a year, then, and you're a SaaS company, or you're a whatever kind of company, there's some benchmarks, but most of those are public comps. You know, there's some private comps, but, um, and so at some level, it's, it's arbitrary. So I pick a valuation that I think is fair, but it's arbitrary, and people either like it or they don't. Yeah. Take it back to culture for one second, because when you're first interviewing somebody or deciding whether you want to bring them on a team, you have any methodology for figuring out if they're going to be culture fit, and then afterwards, how do you identify when maybe that person seemed like they were a fit and they're sliding off into you? Mm. Well, so, so there's a couple of things that you you define. So I met with the gentleman's name, Kevin Somerville, the top organizational psychologist in the country is in Denver. In fact, I just spoke to him yesterday. Um, he worked with big CEOs like Lee Iacocca, sport, uh, you know, sporting coaches like Jack Welsh, and, and he's very plugged into startups when I work with him. And he comes into my office back in my dazzle days, and he sits down with me, and he's rubbing his hands. He goes, okay, what do you stand for? I said, what do you mean, what do I stand for? He said, what are you talking about? What do I stand for? He said, we're going to define the culture. I said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. But we're going to get the team in, and we're going to all sit in a room, and we're going to define the culture together. And he said, no, we're not. He said, what do you stand for? And I said, I don't get what you're trying to do here. I said, I want to do this with the team so that they all embrace it. And he gets kind of huffy with me. He said, if you think for one minute that at, with Steve Jobs or Larry Ellison, or he goes through a litany of CEOs, if you think for one minute the culture of those businesses don't start in their office and what they stand for, you're wrong. So can we get started? I said, okay, we'll get started. <laughs> and it was an unbelievable experience because at the time I was in my 40s and I, I thought I had a pretty clear sense of what I stood for in my belief system. Holy moly, did he grind away at it? You have to, you know, on a head of a pin. Um, because it needs to be clear to people. Um, and then you need to provide examples to the team. And then it needs to be re reinforced by the CEO and the leaders of the company, or it just becomes words on the wall. But that's only half the equation. Then you have to figure out how to interview people. Okay. So I look for people. Um, I look for people that um, have been through great adversity. I think it's one of the things that's required to be in these companies. So I'll ask a question. Uh, give me an example in your life where, you know, against all odds, you figured out how to get through something. And I've had people, I can't tell you the percentage, very high percentage, sit there and bawl in my office about the, the this they went through or the that they went through. I want to know that. Because there's nothing harder than doing a startup. I want to know that they survived. It's you you ultimately in order to scale, you have to you have to build a system where people will behaviorally interview and they pick various questions. 
So you're going to pick the survival question, and you're going to pick the innovation question, and you're going to pick the, the this question and the that questions, and you start to do that. And I interview everybody in these startups until there's until there's about 100 employees. Is, 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 if I can, if I have the bandwidth, I'll interview everybody to kind of be the culture cop, just to make sure that the early team meshes as best we can with the words on the wall. So it's a lot of work. Yes, sir. I have two questions. Um, what's your driving force in you in terms of what, what kind of gets you out of bed every day as you're excited or what you dream, what you want? Um, and then the second one is, um, you know, maybe a correlated with what you said earlier. Who uh, espouses as a CEO, a leader, a corporate leader, or any kind of leader, the values that you think that you uh, espouse? So I'll do it in inverse order. The CEO is the person that defines the, the, the essence of the culture, the values and beliefs. I believe blah, 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 because I value blah, 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 blah. Okay, so you write those down. Okay, and then you communicate them to the company and you give them examples of what these things mean because what you're trying to do, in the absence of explicit cultural definition, People will try to navigate through how to fit and thrive, but they won't really know where the guideposts are. So you got to give them to them. And then it makes it a more efficient organization, a higher performing organization. So that's number one. What drives me, um, so, you know, people are motivated by different things. Some are to make money, some are for fame, Summer to change the world. So, I mean, it goes on and on and on, right? And, and for me, what I've come to realize is I love the idea of taking a germ of an idea and turning it into reality for the end game of ultimately changing people's lives. And I mean the folks that work businesses. I, I, I don't think like this. I just get up and work hard, honestly. And I just see myself as a guy that just does that. I had someone pull me aside a while ago and say, do you realize how many, how many families and how many lives through all these enterprises you've changed? And I don't think like that. The people that got to go that get a good college education or, you know, have a nice wedding or build a new home or, 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 or have career advancements, become famous, on and on and on and on because of the things that you launched and ran. That matters to me these days. A lot. Pretty darn gratifying. And every once in a while, you'll get this random email or phone call from someone saying thank you and you won't even realize that you affected their lives in the way you did. It's like odd, but it feels so good. No. Questions? Yeah. So let's say you, you built a product a prototype and you put it out there for people to use. And uh, regarding those what questions that you, you talked about, uh, you might come up with three to four sets of answers to those questions. Um, so what are your thoughts about like focusing on one, one specific set of users and kind of working just to satisfy them versus keeping your options open and still continuing to go with supporting all those other ca categories of users? Um, one, of the, one of the axioms of success in these young companies is to focus. It's so hard to do one thing really well that to try to do three things well all bets are off. It's all bets are off trying to do the one thing well. So you're just you're just <clears throat> making it harder on yourself. So focus. Pick an audience. Find out what they care about, what they're willing to spend money on, and serve them. If you get that right, you can always expand. If you get it wrong, you have no business. Right. If 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 you'll share this, oh. uh, what techniques did you use to reprogram your brain? 
This is the most fascinating thing I've ever done. So there's a, a, a doctor. Um, he literally comes to your home. He was in my home for 36 hours this weekend. 36 hours. Three days. And um, he doesn't believe in cognitive therapy. So what's cognitive therapy? You go to a therapist, you talk to him about some problem you have in your life, and you figure out where that's coming from, and you learn how to spot it consciously and set boundaries to not do it. So if, uh, I'm gonna make this up, uh, I always uh, pick friends that drink too much. I'm just making this up. Believe it or not, that's not me picking it. Um, what he's proven, and, and, I, and, I, and I actually validated it, um, is our brains are like antennas. And there's some people in this room where their brains, if we put a helmet on their head, the actual brain is being activated by my brain. Others, it's not. And so you attract certain people. You don't even know you're attracting them. It's your brain. And he said, so you can um, consciously attract someone, a friend that drinks too much, and then you can go, oh, drinks too much, I'm not gonna hang out with them. But if you're not good at you know, maintaining your boundaries or you relax them or you're drinking too much or whatever, then it doesn't happen. He said, what if I could have you stop attracting that whatever it is altogether? So your frontal cortex, 20% um, of your brain, is what thinks. It's, it's a sensory brain. It takes in all the senses. Um, and then there's 80% of your brain, which is back here. It's your non-sensory, your subconscious. And it doesn't think. But it controls your behavior. And they know this now. That behavior that's imprinted, I mean, that behavior that, you, that I mean, as an adult, is imprinted, starts at one to seven years old, and it imprints the trauma that you've gone through from one to seven. So that's in there. It imprints the trauma that your parents went through that comes through the embryo. You have a DNA blueprint with markers that's in there with sensitivities. And the only uh, brains that can activate those sensitivities is your an adult brain, meaning your parents. So whatever they teach you, right or wrong, that's activating certain parts of your DNA blueprint. And then over time, of course, other things will go in there, but it's, it's, it's not a thinking part of the brain. It's controlling your behavior, and it's causing your brain to hijack um, in the midst of maybe something's going really well, but deep down inside you're afraid of something, and all of a sudden you do something stupid to blow up something. That's completely out of your control. So what he does is he puts you in a state. Okay, so one other thing. This part of your brain doesn't feel, doesn't cause you to feel. This part of your brain does. So he, he forces you, not forces, he has you go back in time to years one to seven where you create, and you, you, you see certain times in your life but you can't communicate to the back of your brain with words because the front of the brain knows words and it'll trap it. So you have to communicate to it with symbols. Crazy, huh? But you think about something, you visualize it with your eyes closed back one to seven, and if your body starts feeling emotion, you know you've activated this part of your brain because emotion is starting to stir. He knows he's got you into your subconscious self. And then use symbols to program that experience all over again so that it never happens again. Thank you. <laughs> pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, all right. Well, I'm getting a look from outside that we need to wrap this up because it is 6 p.m. <laughs> Was this good? Oh, yeah. 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 Thank you, Bob, for uh, coming in and sharing that journey with us, um, sharing that with everybody, getting a little vulnerable, too. Um, you're one of two people that I know kind of share a lot about values and having value-driven companies here in Austin, the other one being Bret Hurt. 
Um, it's really, I've seen you speak about values at one point, and I, I really appreciate it. It's stuck with me for about a year and a half or so. Um, so it's always great to hear those words. Um, everyone, I want to thank you as well for spending your time here with us today. Um, this has been a lot of fun. Like I said, always one of my favorite Tuesdays of the month, one of my favorite days of the month. Um, you can tell a friend about this too. We want to keep making this bigger and bigger and hope to see, I see a lot of similar faces today, but hopefully